Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that by testing you may know what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them who persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind to one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Repay no one evil for evil but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thus endeth the reading. Did I say it all? <laughs> Woo! <Yay! laughs> well done. We had three more people that completed reciting all of Romans 12 this week. Uh, Aldrith O'Hare, Janet Moore, and Rosalie DiMaggio got the job done. So let's give them a hand. And some of you that are waiting until the last minute to do it, this is that last minute. Today's the day, okay? So uh, uh, why don't you find Crystal after the service and uh, try reciting to her. That's a, a great milestone. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? You ever had one of those weeks? Years. Yeah, years. I, I had, I had one, several years ago, I had one of those weeks where it seemed like in business, everything was just going wrong. And the more I tried to make it better, the worse it got. And I finally photoshopped a little picture that I sent out to my staff that described how I felt about the week. <laughs> Me and my little extinguisher facing the inferno. Um, you know, I've been watching some of the footage over the last few weeks of that volcanic eruption in Hawaii. And one of the things that fascinates me about volcanoes, kind of an ominous thing, is how unstoppable lava is. You watch those flows. They're not going very fast, but you can't stop them. I mean, they try digging trenches. They try putting up walls. They try all kinds of things, but you can't stop it. It just keeps coming. I saw a time lapse of this car that got caught by lava flow, and it took a long time. But once that lava had hold of that car, there was no escaping. And slowly you saw that car just consumed and melted and destroyed by this onslaught of the lava. That image came to my mind as I was looking at what will be our wrap-up to this series in Romans chapter 12. The final verse, verse 21, where Paul says, Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. 
You know, it sometimes, to me, it feels like the things that are going wrong in the world are kind of like that lava flow. It just feels like it keeps moving and things keep getting worse and things go up in smoke that you didn't think would go up in smoke. And, and how do you stop it? Things that uh, we would say from a Christian point of view aren't good become increasingly embraced and endorsed by our society. Things that are addictions that own people. We talked several weeks ago about the problem of pornography and, and how thousands, millions of men and women find themselves caught up and addicted to porn. And yet, it's rampant. It, it seems to be everywhere and almost unstoppable. Gambling addictions consume thousands, and yet state governments have made it a primary way of earning income despite the damage that it does. We know the problems of drug addictions, and yet we find governments wanting to legalize more and more drugs. We think about the breakdown in families. Family units becoming more and more fragmented. In 1964, only 10% of births in the United States happened outside of wedlock, outside of having a mom and a dad present. As of the latest CDC figures, that has now climbed to 40% of births in the United States happen outside of wedlock. We talk about abortion and all the lives that have been impacted, and abortion rates are falling. That is good news. But one of the reasons they're falling, which is bad news, is because we are now making abortion drugs available so that lives are being taken without a woman ever going into a clinic. And of course, we've begun to legalize euthanasia, which causes us increasingly to view the elderly and the severely handicapped as an expendable liability that can be taken care of uh, humanely and quickly. Societal norms are being challenged, it seems, on every front. We're not even sure now how many genders there are. Anyone who's ever taken their first year of biology shouldn't be confused about that, and yet, we're not sure. And when those issues move from just headlines we read about to biography, when those issues become close and personal because of people that we love, people we know, people we associate with, it creates a lot of pressure to know how do we respond. There are youth who love Jesus that find their convictions being ridiculed at school or in the locker room, riding on the bus. College students that encounter hostile professors that will publicly mock them as uneducated because of their faith. Maybe it happens in our own work world, colleagues we work with, or the lunchroom or the carpool, that we find ourselves being in the minority because of what we believe and who we follow. We find on social media, or maybe the folks that we go golfing with, that again, what we believe and what we love is, is not respected, is not endorsed, in fact, maybe mocked. And sometimes the pressure is right in our home. It's our spouse, it's our parents. It's siblings, other extended family members. Christmas is coming. For some of us, that brings some anxiety because we're going to be spending a couple of days with folks that uh, we all know the conversation could take a bad turn. It could get on to the wrong topic, and suddenly everyone is going to be really tense. And when these kinds of things happen, when we find that the, the tide of public opinion and, and the, the morality that surrounds us is, is turning. Sometimes we just want to go and hide. I did some looking this week. I found that for $20,000, there's a company in Estonia that will sell you a mobile bomb shelter. They say you can install this in 90 minutes once you have the hole dug. Now, I don't know if you, by the time you know the bombs are raining, do you really have time to go dig the hole and install your mobile bomb shelter? But, but I think some of us kind of would, would like that. We would like a way to just escape. You know, crawl in a hole and put the dirt over and, and just let the world go by. Now, maybe you're not into this kind of bomb shelter. I have good news for a few million. There are also luxury bomb shelters. <laughs> These people are living better underground than I live above ground. The pressure of prevalent evil 
of society going in the wrong direction is nothing new. I shared with you a couple weeks ago from Tacitus, his annals, where he recounts how in AD 64, Nero undertook a persecution against Christians and went so far as to crucify their bodies and light them on fire and use them as street lamps at night along the streets in Rome. In the early 1700s, I read a book recently called The Forgotten Founding Father. It's the story of George Whitfield. And he recounts what the moral environment was like in Britain as well as the United States, but it begins in Britain. Let me just read to you a little bit of his description of what was going on in England in the early 1700s. Sel seldom in history has a nation changed its moral character so radically as England did in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. In the land where Puritans once ruled, Lady Montague would quip that Parliament was, quote, preparing a bill to have not taken out of the commandments. It was nearly true. Depravity had become the fashion, corruption the popular rage. Vice ruled the day and bred a savagery that festered even in the law. The courts made more than 160 offenses, many of them minor, punishable by hanging. A new form of entertainment was born, the public execution. Crowds, ridden with bloodlust, jeered, taunted, and gambled on how long the victim would last. The wealthy enjoyed picnics in their carriages while listening to the last gasps of the dying. Gangs ruled many neighborhoods and raging masses so often went on riotous looting sprees that they took for themselves the name Sir Mob. England entered a horrible time called the gin craze. Astoundingly, every sixth house in London became a gin shop with signs advertising drunk for one penny, dead drunk for two pence. It was fed to infants when they cried, given to children to make them sleep, and consumed to the point of intoxication by most every adult. One bishop complained that gin has made the English people what they never were before, cruel and inhuman. Most clergymen nestled easily into the depravity of the age. When the French jurist and philosopher Montesquieu returned to France from England in 1731, he seriously reported that the English had no religion. Quote, a converted minister is as rare as a comet. In 1917, Lenin's October Revolution saw a large realignment of states that, that ended up putting this massive empire, the Soviet Union, together. And it became one of the first officially atheistic nations. Atheism was taught from the earliest stages. In fact, one of the practices that would happen in elementary schools is, is little students, kindergarten, first graders, would uh, be told that, of course, there was no God, and to prove the point, they, as a class, were encouraged to pray to God and ask God to give them candy. So the teacher would lead the class in a little prayer, they'd ask for candy, and of course, no candy would appear. The teacher then explained how it was really Lenin and the, and the socialist state that was the provider of good things, and, and now led the class in another little prayer, this one to Uncle Lenin, asking if Uncle Lenin would provide them with candy. The door of the classroom would open, an assistant would throw in candy to the students, and the lesson had been taught. All good things came from Uncle Lenin. Christians were forced to fellowship in secret. The penalty for openly practicing your faith or indoctrinating your children would include ridicule, the loss of your job, loss of promotions, imprisonment in the infamous gulags, and even death. In 1949, Communist China arose and expelled all foreign missionaries and began a totalitarian crackdown against religion. Uh, mission organizations in the West felt that China had been lost, that all the, all the effort, all the blood and the sweat that had been poured in there, it was all for naught now that they had been driven out and the church was being crushed by that communist regime. And of course, from the 1960s to the present, the United States itself has seen lots of turbulence in what we call the culture wars. Many of them fought in our legislatures and in our courts. 
Increasingly, these have become a battle between those who wish to have freedom of religion and those who wish to have freedom from religion. In 1962, prayer and Bible reading was banned from schools. Today, there are teachers in many school districts that face real pressure and are being marginalized if in any way they allow their faith to enter into the workplace. Locally, we've watched the drama with Coach Kennedy down in Bremerton, the assistant football coach who had a habit of going out on the football game after the game was over and, and just for himself quietly offering a prayer for the teams. The end result was that someone complained and ultimately he lost his job. In 1973, the Supreme Court, in their infamous Roe v. Wade ruling, opened the floodgates to legalized abortion. Since that time, 60 million children have died in utero as a result, and millions of men and women bear the scars emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And yet today, pharmacists who would have Christian convictions, who would opt not to dispense abortion-inducing drugs, will find themselves in danger of losing their career. Not because they haven't medicated with professionalism, with excellence, not because they haven't wanted to promote life, but simply because they do not wish to use their skills to promote death. In 2013, the Supreme Court declared that same-sex marriages were now legal, the law of the land. And we've watched the ramifications of that decision in our own state once again. You probably know the story of Baron L. Stutzman, the florist, who had a client for years, a, a gay gentleman that uh, was a friend of hers. She had done lots of flower arranging for her, but one day he came and said that he was planning now to get married and wanted to know if she would do the flowers for the wedding. And, and she explained politely that because of her convictions as a Christian about what marriage was, what God's design was, that she couldn't participate in that. She actually offered three other florists that she knew that would do the wedding to, to help out. But of course, that answer wasn't enough. She's found herself in court, her career, her business threatened. That case is still in the courts and on appeal. You know, there are certainly people who, in the name of Jesus, have taken their stand for their convictions in ways that are bullheaded, that are provocative, and that really are just asking for a fight. Sometimes we seem to delight in the sense that we're being persecuted for righteousness' sake, and we're really being persecuted for is being a jerk. But in many of these situations, the people involved really have done their best to live peaceably. Baron L. Stutzman offered to find another florist. Coach Kennedy made a point to wait until the game was over before he, on his own private time, went out to pray quietly. And yet he lost his job. I don't know about you, but when I witness things like that, I find my temperature rising. It, it seems so unjust. It seems abusive. It seems like the persecution of good people who meant no harm and simply wanted to live by their faith and their conscience. And then I want to fight back. I sympathize with the Apostle Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember what happened to Peter? There he is with Jesus in the garden. Jesus is there to pray, and suddenly this group of soldiers shows up to arrest Jesus. The, the kindest, truest, most sincere man that Peter has ever known, that he respects above anyone he's ever met, is now being taken under arrest by a mob of soldiers. And what does Peter do? He pulls out his sword, and he whacks off an ear, proving that he was not a trained soldier. <laughs> you know, we probably all have done a little ear whacking in our time. We've, we've become enraged at something that, that seemed unjust, not right, and, and we lash out. And sometimes that lashing out has been terrible. There have been abortionists who have been assaulted and killed by people who felt that they were somehow serving the cause of Christ in doing that. 
There have been people who have carried banners, wore t-shirts proclaiming themselves Christian, who have screamed and sworn and spit and cursed at people in gay pride parades. If you follow social media, you will see people who identify themselves as followers of Jesus who who regularly get caught up in, in condemning in the most demeaning terms possible those that they see as their ideological enemies. And righteous anger so easily becomes a destructive, thrashing fury at all things evil. My question is, have we forgotten whose side we are on? What was Jesus' response to Peter's attack? He said, put your sword away. And then he healed the servant's ear. What happens when being a culture warrior fails? What do we do when, when we feel like we fought the fight for what is right and, and our side lost? Well, it's interesting to see Peter's response. Peter was ready to take on the whole armed guard one minute, and then Jesus says, that's not how we're going to do this. Put your sword away. So what does Peter do next? Then all the disciples left him and fled. That's the temptation, isn't it? When evil presses in, when it seems unstoppable, the temptation is to run away, to just disappear into the crowd. In fact, as later that night, we find that Peter, actually in a pretty bold move, sneaks into the courtyard where the trial of Jesus is happening. He is right in the hornet's nest, if you will. But then someone saw him and said, you're one of them, aren't you? You're one of his followers. And, and how does Peter, Peter who one minute was willing to wield the sword, how does he respond now? I don't know the man. I, I never met him. I have nothing to do with him. Leave me alone. You know, I think there are two ways that evil overcomes us. The first is self-righteousness. When that happens, evil has really drug us down to its level. We decide to fight fire with fire. Paul has already warned us in Romans 12 about this kind of hard-headed, win-at-all-costs, take-no-captives approach, hasn't he? He says that we should bless those who persecute us. He said that we should not be haughty, that we should never be wise in our own sight. We should repay no one evil for evil, but that we should give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And that if it's possible, as far as it depends on us, we should live peaceably with all. There's no room for self-righteousness. But here's the other way that we respond when we feel like we've lost the culture war. We fall to cowardice. I've always been fascinated with camouflage in nature. It, it's intriguing the things that God has built into the natural world by way of camouflage. And one of my favorite little critters is any kind of a leaf bug. I just think leaf bugs are so fascinating. Right down to quivering on the leaf like the breeze is blowing on them, they look for all the world like they're just part of the bush. And I think some of us would like to be a leaf bug. We, we see a lot of stuff around us that, that is opposed to Jesus Christ, that feels hostile, and, and it would be nice to just kind of melt into the background and just be a little leaf bug. Just look like everything around us and sound like everything around us and pretend to be like everybody else and hope that nobody notices us. I think Paul has addressed that as well here in Romans chapter 12. He said that we should present ourselves to God as, as a living sacrifice that means that sometimes there is a cost in following Jesus. He said that we should not be conformed to this world. We shouldn't be a little leaf bug. We shouldn't try to look like, sound like, be like what's around us, trying to push us into the mold. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds. He says that we should abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. And when things get hard, we should be patient in tribulation. We should hang in there. 
Sometimes it's not that we run and hide, but we find ourselves bending to the steady breeze. We're like trees blown by the wind, and and over time, we, we simply bow to the pressure. I just want to remind us of who it is that we serve. John, in his opening verses, says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When John talks about the light, he's talking about Jesus Christ. If you want to see a moment where it looks like evil has overcome, then just picture a man stripped naked, beaten, bleeding, hanging on a cross, gasping his last breaths, surrounded by his enemies who are mocking him, and you see the picture of someone who has been completely overcome. Or at least it looks that way. John says, the light shines in the darkness. In the darkness, it may have thought it had overcome, but that's not true. Jesus said to his disciples, in the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says to his disciples, who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When you think that evil will overcome, I want you to be reminded of the fact that we serve a risen Christ. That when darkness thought it had won and had overcome, it had already lost the battle. And Jesus says the gates of hell themselves will not prevail. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And then Paul would say earlier in his letter to the Romans, these verses that that I love from Romans chapter 8, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. If you want to feel powerless, just imagine yourself as a lamb in a stockyard awaiting slaughter. You've never seen sheep band together in an effective army to defend themselves, have you? He says, this is how the world looks at us. We we are defenseless. We, we, We have lost if that's what the battle is all about. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, as parents, Burnett and I used to remind ourselves at times that you don't have to enforce gravity. Truth is true. There there are consequences that go with defying gravity that parents don't even have to enforce because it's just true. It's the way the world is. God's truth remains true no matter what public opinion may be. It doesn't matter if the people that are saying it's not true have lots of letters behind their name. God is the ultimate ground and source of all truth. 
I'm not saying that we should be passive in the public square, that, that when we see things that, that we know fly in the face of what is right going on, that we just go, oh, well, at least we know what's true and I don't need to do anything. I, I think we do need to speak. We live in a society that gives us a vote. Many societies, there is not that opportunity, but our society gives us the opportunity to be informed on issues and to vote and to vote by our conscience. And I believe as Christians, we should do that. However, when a political or a cultural fight is lost, I want to encourage us to fight the urge to become enraged at the victors. Amen. We may be overcome at the ballot box. We may be overcome in popular opinion. We may be overcome in human courts. But God's truth is never ultimately overcome. The core needs of the human heart have not changed. The deepest solution for every person is still for a person who is far from God to be brought near to him. It is for that person to find that he or she is loved more deeply than they ever thought possible. That they can be forgiven for the things that bring shame deep in their heart. For that person to give themselves to Christ and, and then to allow his Holy Spirit to take up residence and begin rearranging the furniture of their soul. Here's how the story ends. Behold, I'm coming soon. Jesus says, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We don't have to be afraid that somehow evil wins in the end. So how do we win? Well, I love the quote by uh, Chesty Polar, United States Marine Corps. I've shared this before. We've been looking for the enemy for some time now. We finally found him. We're surrounded. That simplifies things. <laughs> How do we win? Well, first, we don't fight fire with fire. That is my natural reaction when, when I see good being attacked. My natural reaction is to shoot back. I want to vent my spleen. How is that for a weird expression? Vent your spleen. You know where that comes from? Back in the 1600s, they thought that all the emotions had different bodily organs that they were seated in. And anger was seated in your spleen. Why? I have no idea. And, and to vent something is to let off the pressure. So the idea of venting your spleen is what we would say now is blow your top. You know, I see this stuff and I just, I just want to blow up at it. I want to teach people a lesson. You know, have a, have a comeback that will leave them speechless, that will humiliate their stupid point, that will cause them to see how right I am. Paul's counsel counters that. He would say, leave your spleen unvented and bless those who persecute you. Don't waste time planning on how to teach them a lesson. Get revenge, but seek their good. Fight fire with faith, hope, and love. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We learn to think and speak good. That's grammatically bad. What I mean is well. But we need to learn how to think well. The world around is going to apply all kinds of pressure telling you what you must think about everything from how life began on the planet to when life begins in the womb. There are politically correct and biblically wrong opinions on just about every aspect of sex from gender to porn. Take your pick. You'll be told that you're ignorant, phobic, abusive if your opinion differs on any of a wide range of topics. Frankly, sometimes when I hear how Christians respond to their critics, I tend to agree with their critics. Not because I disagree with what we believe, but sometimes we don't really understand the issue. And we haven't thought too much about the words that we use and how we answer. And people give defenses that are shallow, misguided, 
And when they blur them with lots of anger, they are more hurtful than helpful. There are a lot of good Christian thinkers out there. And I would just encourage you, when you come up against some of these cultural issues that that you know are at odds with, with a Christian ethic, that you take the time to educate yourself. Look for thoughtful people, not just the angry ones, to read. That's part of getting a transformed mind. And then think about how you speak. Think about the words that you use. See, the goal of answering error isn't to confront an enemy. It is to win a heart to Jesus. Paul said, never repay evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable. We are to act for the good. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. I am truly grateful that I see so many ways in this community that Christians are, are practically stepping forward to meet some of the pressing issues of our culture with good, with love, with grace. We talk about the problem of abortion and and out-of-wedlock pregnancies and and all of that. And and I'm so grateful we have a group like Obria. used to be called My Choice. His name is just in the process of changing. But but Obria has come forward providing professional medical care, parenting classes, diapers, other supplies, support to help moms, dads, know how to bring a life into the world and and love that little life and support them. Not just shake signs and and yell bumper sticker slogans, but but stepping in with love to do good. This last fall, we started our new program, Boost, because we see kids who are caught up in cycles of of often dysfunction, poverty, fragmented families, And and we said, how do we come alongside and support these families and support these kids and and love them and help them? And and a lot of you are involved in that. Going in to meet with children and and read with them and help them with math. And and it opens up doors to meet their parents and to build relationships there to love them, to love them for Jesus. We've had the program Celebrate Recovery going on now for almost a year. We talk about the evils of of addictions and how it it takes control of people's lives. And and there is a whole group of you that have stepped forward, both to be honest about the addictions you have struggled with, as well as to come alongside others who are struggling with grace, with community, with prayer, to bring Jesus into that situation to find freedom. We talk about the problems that youth are facing. I see our youth group doing an effective job. They call themselves Kinetic Northwest, or junior high, senior high ministries that that are reaching out to kids in our community. And and you as adults that have gotten involved with those youth to come in as mentors, plugging into lives to overwhelm evil with good. See, this is the culmination of what Paul has been addressing, I think, in this whole chapter. We overcome evil when we willingly present our bodies as living sacrifices of service to God. When we love with genuineness and we abhor evil and we hold fast to what is good. We overcome evil when we engage in the discipline of learning to think like Jesus and not allowing the world around to shape our values and our reactions. We overcome evil when we as people with transformed minds link ourselves in meaningful relationships with other followers of Jesus and then actively seek to engage enthusiastically the gifts that God has given us to minister for good. We overcome evil when we as people with transformed minds join in meaningful relationships with other followers of Jesus, employing the gifts that he has given us Go and engage the world, not with hostility when wronged, but with something they never saw coming, with blessing, compassion, grace, love. Wherever we encounter it, the strategy is the same. We overcome evil with good. And when we do, you have no idea what good God may do. 
What about all those times in history when Christians probably thought the sky was falling? In AD 64, Nero was burning Christians on crosses. And Roman culture continued to decline and descend into depravity. Infanticide and abandonment of the elderly became commonplace. During the plagues, the sick were simply abandoned in the streets to die. And no one would touch or bury the dead bodies, except for Christians. It was Christians who stepped in and, and rescued abandoned children out of the street. It was Christians who cared for the sick that were being afflicted by the plague. It was Christians who stepped forward to bury the bodies of the dead, often at great risk to themselves. And in A.D. 380, Constantine declared Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. In the early 1700s, England was dark, godless, brutal, addicted. But then came what we call the First Great Awakening, Evangelists like George Whitfield, John and Charles Wesley, Jonathan Edwards preached the gospel. They also led movements of compassion that cared for orphans, that helped get derelicts off the street. Patrick Henry, the American patriot, said that would that every bearer of God's glad tidings be as fit a vessel of grace as Mr. Whitfield. And as hearts changed, so did society. It's reported that mules in Wales quit working in the mines because they no longer recognized the commands that the mule drivers were giving them because they didn't have profanity laced through them anymore. God brought a great revival, a great awakening into that culture that swept throughout Britain, Scotland, Wales, and into the United States. In the 1940s, the Soviet Union's aggressive atheism erected what we called the Iron Curtain how could you get through an iron curtain? And yet today, the curtain is gone. The Soviet Union as such is no more. Last August, I was in Ukraine, and I worshipped openly with Christian believers in Ukraine. China's communists expelled Christian missionaries. They enforced their own brand of atheism. Forty years later, Western Christians again made contact with the church in China fearing what they would find, thinking they would find a church that had been decimated and, and left in ruins. What they found instead was a church that was thriving, that was stronger and bigger and better than when they had left. And yes, there's still persecution today. If you followed the headlines, you'll, you'll recognize the Chinese government is once again cracking down on Christians in that country. And yet, Christianity continues to grow. In fact, at the current rate of growth, it's estimated there will be more Christians in China than in the United States by 2030. The growth of Christianity in these places did not come about through political power. Christians had no political power. The courts were not deciding in their favor. The elections didn't go their way. But what did happen was the witness of believers who actively loved their neighbors who spoke about the gospel, who prayed for the sick, who ministered to the sick and the hurting. Good overcame evil. So do you want to fight evil? Well, then I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body there are many members, and not all members have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ." and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ, according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes with generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. 
Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be patient in tribulation. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen?